let me move on to the final piece of this uh, dipole lecture. And really, this is the part that interests me, but I think this is net less uh, um, needed for uh, comparison with the magnetism. But in, in any case, I, you know, this is the part that in other semesters, I never had the time to. So <laughs> now I have the time and I want to actually go over this. <laughs> so, um, so this is going to be application of something you learned last week and you are, we were wrapping up this week, which is application involving electric potential and fields. So let me title it that um, electric potential and field. And as an example of that application, I am using dipole of electric dipole. I guess um, electric is a little bit redundant. So let, let, me, uh, let me set up the situation. So I'm going to have a coordinate axis if for no other reason, because that makes a certain things easier. <laughs> I, you know, I can talk about things more concretely, not just abstractly waving my hands at. Um, so let me set up my dipole in a way that's uh, more manageable, um, symmetrically or around the origin. So let me have a positive Q here minus Q here, and um, they are going to be separated by distance D. So you know what coordinates they are at. This is at zero D half and, and so on. I think this is the exact same setup your textbook uses. So I guess the thing to do right now is to um, determine the, um, determine, figure out, the, um, the electric potential due to this uh, dipole arrangement. So I want to write down electric potential of a dipole as a function of X and Y. And uh, you, I could also have a G coordinate here. The way I set this up here, the special axis here is Y because that's the axis that the displacement is along. The, um, you know, if you want to introduce a g-axis, you can kind of do it alongside the x. Once we have a form, it'll be clearer how it can be introduced. So, so let me just pick a representative point uh, for which to describe the electric potential. And I think most of uh, the discussion that I'll go through will probably resemble what you will see in the textbook, but it's good to see. Uh, good to see everything twice, <laughs> if for no other reason, because I might make a mistake and it might be amusing. Um, so now there is a very distinct advantage in dealing with the potential. You can see it even here, which is that I know I think you have never seen me try to figure out electric field of a dipole at an arbitrary point out in space. Uh, I might have done in done that in one of the lectures, let's say along the axis here, like I can pick a point here and I can figure out electric field due to this. I can figure out, okay, positive charge, electric field points that way, negative charge, electric field points that way. So this is going to be the net electric field. Let's figure out the components and do all that. I can do that <laughs> for here and I can do that along the axis here. But any arbitrary point, I mean, I can, and I can come up with some expression, but that expression is gonna be uh, horribly complicated. So, so, you know, it's really not <laughs> worth doing it, so I've never done it. With the potential, it's not going to be all that complicated. And the biggest reason for that is potential is a scalar. So, when, so you know the very, you saw the very first thing I did when I was uh, trying to figure out the electric field. I <laughs> looked at the components, I drew the arrows. With the potential, I don't have to do any of that. All I have to do is to figure out, okay, what is the potential due to a positive charge? What is the potential due to minus charge? And once I have those, simply add them together. That's my combined electric potential and then I'm done. I don't have to figure out the components. I don't have to do any of that. 
So, so let me do that. There is still a little bit of um, tedious work in figuring out the, um, so one thing I do need to figure out is the distance. So there's this, this uh, there's this distance r plus, and there's this distance r minus, and I do need to figure that out because um, the this is the formula I'm going to be relying on. That electric potential due to a point charge is the Coulomb constant times the amount of charge divided by the distance. And this distance is the distance from the charge to the point where I'm calculating the potential. So, so let me figure out those two quantities. Um, R plus, let's see, I think it's easiest if I draw this triangle. Um, so this side of the triangle is simply going to be X. And this side of the triangle is going to be y minus d half. And here's a kind of an amazing thing. This expression will work for all the points y in all four quadrants um, because I'm going to be squaring it. So it's really the magnitude that matters. So even if y is, I don't know, between 0 and d, uh, it's still going to work. Even if, if, even if y is zero, it'll work. Even if y is negative, it'll work because when you take the negative quantity and subtract the over two, the magnitude is gonna increase. So I just want to highlight that this expression is something that works not just for the point I illustrated here, but it works generally. So, um, so given these two legs of the right triangle, the hypotenuse is given by the Pythagorean theorem, square root of the x squared plus y minus d half squared. The um, r minus that's given similarly, let me consider this triangle here. So it's going to be, um, the, the x component will be the same. The y component this time will be y plus d over two. This will be y plus d over two. And as before, this expression will work for all um, all the different points in the space. So x squared plus y plus the, oops, um, did the square to our way. y plus d over two squared. So all right, I have the two distances. So my potential, it will be this. Um, so my, the potential um, of the dipole arrangement here will be the potential due to the positive charge plus the potential due to minus charge, which will be K times Q over R plus square root of X squared plus Y minus D half squared. Um, plus k oh, sorry, uh, times minus q over square root of x squared plus y minus d half, uh, y plus d half squared. <laughs> um, so you, you can simplify this a little bit, but I guess, um, Mm. Well, let me first do the simplification that I can, which is I can factor out k times q. And um, yeah, so let me do that first, k e q. And then what you have in here is one over this quantity minus one over this quantity. Um, x squared plus y plus d over two squared. And I guess as long as you're dealing with a finite d, as in finite charge separation, um, there isn't much more you can do. You're kind of 
stop there. <laughs> and, um, so this is where it's uh, useful to consider this uh, limiting case where, um, where D is much smaller than, um, well, much smaller than R plus or R minus. And you can actually consider this in two different ways. One is uh, to say that you are considering points very far away. That's one. The other way, which is more interesting from um, practical application purposes, is to consider the case where it's D approaching zero in such a way with a corresponding change in charges so that QD is constant. Um, that's another way you can bring about the same limiting case. In the end, the, the limit is the same, that D is much less than these distances. And that implies one thing. It implies that D is much less than um, X or Y in terms of absolute value. So when you consider the limit, considering the limit allows you to simplify this setup quite a bit um, and kind of highlight why this quantity is important. So I'm going to pull a, I don't know, rabbit out of a hat, <laughs> which is, I think, it, I don't think this is the approach your textbook takes, but I think I can take this one. Um, let's see here. Um, so this is what I want to consider. As I look at this, I see how similar these two expressions are. It, uh, um, I mean, you know, they are not similar enough that I can simplify them more. The square root is just maddening me in the way. Uh, really, these two expressions are different, only in that this is minus and this is plus. And in fact, I can even write it down this way. Let's see. Um, let me define a function f. Um, of y, where everything else is constant, then um, define this uh, function as 1 over square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's a function I'm defining. And I can express what is here as f of y minus d over 2 and define so uh, define what's on the, the in the second term as f of y plus d over 2. So with that description what is the difference here that looks like is and let me move this out of the way with these um, convenient function definitions, what that looks like, uh, what those two terms look like is, um, f of um, y minus d over two minus f of y plus d over two. Now, this is the um, trick <laughs> I want to use, which is I want to rewrite this expression in this way. Let me divide it by D and then multiply by D. I'm just multiplying a number by one. I'm allowed to do that. You can't stop me. And in the, this limiting case that I was talking about earlier, um, let me apply that limit to what I see here right now. So what I see here right now, let me say limit as D goes to zero. 
And I guess I'll apply the limit to that D over there, but for now, let me limit my attention to this portion here. <laughs> um, I hope uh, you are getting my hint at what I'm getting at here. Uh, th this is conspicuously written in a way so that it looks uh, like a definition of derivative. Uh, I m do need to fix a few things. I think uh, I need to move this one here, this one here. So there might be a minus sign in front so that this can be plus and this can be minus. The thing here is that it's a difference between a function divided by the parameter that's causing that difference. Let's take the limit where that parameter goes to zero. That's the definition of a derivative. <laughs> so, so, so let me do that. I am going to replace what's in here with this. I am going to replace that with the minus of the derivative of the function uh, with respect to y. I'm going to leave x alone uh, times d. That's this d here. So now, you know, in general, that's not, that's not, that's not precisely correct. But this is the magic of calculus. This is the magic of the limiting procedure that in the limit where d goes to zero, that, that gives you the exact result. So, so let me take the derivative. Um, I need to take the derivative of f of y. So when you take the derivative, you get, um, all right, let me rewrite it this way first. Uh, y squared raised to power of minus one half, and it's this thing that I'm taking derivative of. <laughs> so now I can use the power rule, bring down a factor of minus one half. And, it, and then I'm using chain rule. So, or I, let me finish using the power rule. Square plus y squared to the power of minus three halves and using the chain rule, um, I applying the derivative to the inside, uh, so it should be times two y. Um, yeah, that, that seems like right derivative. Okay, so let me, um, so uh, the half cancels out with the two, so I end up with equals minus y divided by x squared plus y squared raised to the power of three halves. All looking good, I think. Um, and let me plug, so let me plug this uh, expression into that space there, and I will um, write out the cleaned up version here. So the poten electric potential of a dipole is equal to KEQ times, and I notice I have a minus sign here, and I'll have minus sign there that'll cancel each other out. So I'm just gonna write down the positive quantity. I have a Y here, I have D there, so let me write those. Um, let me write d first, d times y divided by x squared plus y squared raised to power three halves. And let me just uh, check the units to make sure that units make sense here. Um, so with the uh, electric potential, you should have a unit of Coulomb constant times charge divided by a single factor of length. So I have here so far two factors of length on the numerator and in the denominator, you know, squared, square rooted, raised to the third power. So three factors of length. So, the, so I probably didn't make any algebra mistake. And so th this is what you see with the electric potential of a uh, um, over a dipole. I guess 
let's see here. Um, I feel like I might have made a mistake somewhere. Um, because I'm getting an expression that looks like it might go to x to the third power, and I want it to go x squared. Um, let me do a bit of a sanity check. So, oh, um, I, I know why. Because I'm considering the values of potential where y is equal to zero, and I can't do that because <laughs> at y equals zero, the potential is zero. <laughs> so the distance dependence there is meaningless. And um, I, I think what's more instructive is to consider how the potential varies along the axis y. So I think this is the correct result. And this is where you see the uh, meaningfulness of the electric dipole uh, moment, the charge times the displacement. So we can treat this as a constant and the rest is a function of position. And in the limit where y goes to infinity, uh, what you see this potential doing is it's proportional to y divided by y squared raised to three halves or one over y squared. So, so with the point charge, the potential went down as one over the distance. With the dipole, the potential goes as one over distance squared. And that's a general feature you would see in a, uh, in a dipole potential, that it falls off more quickly than a monopole potential does. And it's the same thing for a quadrupole. The potential for that goes down more quickly than a dipole potential would. And so when you look at the interaction like, uh, in interaction like this one here, the initial attraction, which is driven by um, dipole and other object interaction, that's uh, much more distance dependent than a interaction of a charged object with another charge would be. So, so that's an uh, electric potential. And let me, oh, I, mm, I'm out of time. <laughs> um, I do want to use this as a way to, um, yeah, let, let me use this expression, the, um, the dipole of uh, uh, the electric potential of a dipole to derive expressions for electric fields. That'll give you something you can compare to and, and see how much it, easier it was. Um, I guess if you're comparing to maybe Rather than relying on this expression, let me go back to my earlier, more exact expression where I didn't take this limit yet. So, so yeah, let me do that. Um, yeah, so to do that, what I will do is let me just uh, select everything here. And I'm gonna uh, copy it down and then erase the parts that, um, that I don't need. Hope that worked. Okay, good. Uh, that worked. Oh, all right. So let me erase much of this. So all the limiting work that um, for this uh, particular comparison we will need. Because, you know, a lot of this uh, work I did just now, it was to get an expression that's more mathematically easier to deal with. And it's not strictly necessary to the comparison with expressions of, uh, for electric field that, that you might have seen elsewhere. So for the purpose of that comparison, I won't take an arbitrary point because frankly, <laughs> with arbitrary points, we don't have anything to compare it to. Uh, what I will do is I'll take a point along the x-axis that um, is easy enough to do the same calculation with electric fields and compare. And I will take a point along the y-axis. That's the same deal. Easy enough to do 
um, calculation for the electric field and compare. Just, uh, all right, um, so I want to calculate electric field and I'll try to do this quickly since I'm already on <laughs> over time. Um, so that's out of my way. So I just want to do a quick calculation for electric field um, along the x-axis. So that would be electric field at some arbitrary points over x and where y equals zero. That's a calculation that I think I can do fairly easily. And I want electric values of electric field at, um, at along the y-axis, that is at x equals zero and arbitrary values of y. So that's the second calculation that I think is fairly easy to do. So this is where um, the, you see usefulness of electric potential for more, I guess, theoretical calculations. Because to do this calculation, all we have to do is take the expression for the electric potential as a function of x and y, I really do highly recommend that you hold off on plugging in these values until the very end. Sometimes if you plug it in too early, you uh, zero out a term that you shouldn't have zeroed out. So potential as a function of X and Y, you take the derivative with respect to, um, so it's really the component that you care about. And here I know intuitively enough that at points along the x-axis, the electric field only point along the x-direction. So if I find the x-component, I'm done. Um, and I can also do the same calculation with um, the partial derivative with respect to y, but I'll leave that for you to try. So to find the x-component of the electric field, actually, sorry, um, my intuition was wrong, it's not, with the disarrangement, my electric field is not along the x-axis, it is along the y-axis. So, um, yeah, yeah, because it's going that way, yeah. So that's gonna be the direction of electric field. So let me find the y component of electric field. Um, so with the partial derivative with respect to y, and uh, I need a minus sign here. And uh, for your own exercise, you can try taking the partial derivative of the potential with respect to x. And after having done that, when you plug in y equals zero, you will see that uh, that goes to zero, showing that the x component of the electric potential is equal to zero for these points that we are describing. So let me take the derivative. The derivative is, um, the main usefulness here is in that, the derivative is usually mathematically easier to take. So when I have this and this, I can just take the derivative term by term, and this is easy enough of a derivative to take. So let me first factor out k, q. That's um, something that's gonna be a common coefficient for all of them. So for the first term, I'm taking the derivative of this term here, which is, um, maybe it's worth rewriting this right now. Let me rewrite it as kq times um, x squared plus y minus d over two squared raised to power of minus one half uh, minus x squared plus y plus d over two raised to power of minus one half so that I can use power rule and then chain rule and then power rule. So it's gonna be minus one half x squared plus y minus d over two squared um, minus three halves. And then chain rule for this inside here um, times two y minus d over two. Um, and then, well, I can use chain rule again, that'll get me one. So I'm done there. And then let me do the second term, uh, which will give me minus times another minus, so plus one half x squared plus y plus d over two squared minus three halves times two, 
y plus d over 2. All right. <laughs> so having worked all that out, I, I see simplifications. I mean, there are some things that simplify right away. Half cancels 2, half cancels 2. And the other great simplification will really come in when I plug in y equals 0, which is why um, which is why there was a calculation we could do even just for straightforward the calculation of electric field. So when I plug in y equals zero here, not only does y go away, this minus sign no longer becomes relevant because when I square it, the minus sign will simply go away. Same thing here, y is zero and this was already plus. And what that does for me is this term right now is now the same as this term here. It just magically. <laughs> and why is it zero here? Now this minus isn't, it's meaningful, so I can't get rid of that. So it's zero. And this y is zero. And this plus, it's meaningful, I can get rid of that. And that's actually an uh, important thing for this calculation here, because it's a this minus a sign that cancels out this minus a sign here. Otherwise, uh, without that minus a sign, these two terms would have just canceled each other out. In fact, that's exactly what happens with the x derivative. That's why the x component is zero here. So, so with all that, let me uh, write down the simplified version. The kq, uh, what else is in the numerator? Um, I think I see d over two. Yeah, so k e q times d over two. So you have that multiplicate. What, what's going on here? Um, d over two. So you have that product of q times d, which I'm telling you is meaningful as a dipole moment, divided by um, x squared plus, plus d over two um, squared raised to power of uh, three halves. Yeah, I didn't forget anything, I hope. I think I got everything. And um, so that's the answer. <laughs> and what you see in this expression here is that electric field due to a dipole goes as proportional to one over distance cubed. Uh, that's, uh, so all the numerator factors are constant. And if you imagine taking x to a value that's uh, much bigger than d over two, then you have x squared raised to the power of three halves. So x raised to the power of three or in the denominator. And this kind of dependence of the electric field on the distance is characteristic for a dipole, goes as a one over distance cubed. So it falls off much more quickly than a, a monopole field does. So that's for electric field along the x-axis. Let me do the electric field along the y-axis after scrolling down a little bit to make room. So this calculation is, well, it's exactly the same. <laughs> so it's, uh, so I still have intuition that along the y-axis, electric field still will point in the y direction. I can kind of see, uh, I see no contribution to x component here. So the electric field component here will still be along y only. And if you have any doubt, you can do the same calculation for the x component and hopefully you'll find the zero. And what I'm going to do is the exact same deal again. I'm going to take the electric potential as a function of x and y, take the partial derivative with respect to y, and take the negative of that. Oh yeah, I forgot a minus sign. And in fact, the field here would point downward. Yeah, so there should be minus sign. Let me do it in different color. <laughs> so there should have been minus sign here <laughs> and there should have been minus sign here. Um, I, I'm not merely joking when I say something about sign errors, that it's a very common form of error. Just, to, you know, when you find, whenever you find it, just fix it. <laughs> okay, so let me keep going. <laughs> so I take the derivative, um, in fact, did I just do that? 
What's the diff Oh, okay. So let me basically copy over the same expression I had before. What's different is what I'm plugging in as zero. So let me copy down the same expression, minus kq times um, minus one half x squared plus y minus d over two squared. So this is the result of the derivative that I've previously taken that I'm borrowing because it's the same derivative with respect to y. Plus one half x squared plus y plus d over two squared minus three halves times two y plus d over two. All right, um, so what's different this time is instead of plugging in y equals zero, I'm plugging in x equals zero. So let, let's see what we get, that's gonna be interesting. So I have, um, this is zero. I have this is zero, uh, and let me cancel the one half with the two, and uh, one half with the two. Hmm. All right. Oh, I do have some simplification. Let me kind of try to do that here. So I have um, this single term squared raised to the power of minus three halves. So it's gonna be. Um, y minus d over two raised to power of three, because the factors cancel, uh, minus three rather, times y minus d over two, that's the same term. So it's gonna be plus one here. Okay, I have that term there. And looking at this term here, it's gonna be a different term, but it simplifies in a similar way. It's y plus d over two, raised to the power of minus three, and then plus one. So, all right. Um, so with that, this is the expression I end up with, minus keq times, and this time I, there's no way getting around that I have two terms. Um, let me um, absorb this minus sign in so that um, I'm starting, so that I'm starting out with a positive term. Um, so, so my kq times the first positive term, uh, and so so that I don't forget, this is going to become negative. The first positive term, um, one over y minus d over two squared. Plus, or sorry, minus one over y plus d over two squared. All right, that's the expression. Let me, um, Check this, uh, do some uh, sanity check on this. Because uh, the electric field due to a dipole, especially along the y-axis, it can be a interesting thing. Um, so above the positive charge, this electric field should point up. Below the positive charge and above the negative charge, it should point down, I think. And below the negative charge, it should point up again. Let me see if that's uh, what I get. Um, at the values of y greater than d over two, this is, uh, the first term is, um, first, so both the terms are positive because both this denominator and this denominator are positive. Now the first term is greater. The, this overall term is greater because the denominator is less. So in, this, in the region up here, this whole quantity here is positive. Good, I think. The, the sign of this uh, term is matching up with what I intuitively say the direction of negative electric field is. In between the region where um, in the region where y is greater than minus d over two, 
but less than d over 2. I think this whole combination is going to be negative um, because, well, I mean, hmm, one thing that doesn't quite make sense when y is equal to zero, why do I see this canceling out? When y is equal to zero, electric field isn't zero. So that could indicate a mistake somewhere. Uh, there might be some sign issue that sometimes comes up when you are squaring and um, when you are messing with the powers. <laughs> um, so let me just leave that as a um, oddity, that the fact that this goes to zero when y is equal to zero, that seems feels wrong to me. So um, it, we are already 20 minutes over time, so I'll um, track down the particular error else particular problem elsewhere. I'm pretty sure the problem is somewhere in the simplification steps here. Some of that probably is conditional on what side y is. So let me leave that for now. And, um, and when, um, when y is negative, it also doesn't work out. When y is negative, um, Elect the quantity here is um, is negative, and I don't think that's right. Yeah, that definitely isn't right. Mm. Okay, so um, this particular, so I'm just gonna put a big question mark here, and if we need it, I'll <laughs> come back to it later. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, I'm not quite saying where in the expression here I made a mistake. Um, sorry, that, that really just doesn't seem right. Um, um, I think the mistake might be here. I observed this y minus d half in, and I think that um, Yeah, that ignores a sign where it shouldn't be ignored. So um, the expression here, let me write it down carefully, not so cavalierly. Um, so when you write it down carefully, what it should be is, so the denominator will be y minus d over two absolute value raised to third power and the numerator which shouldn't be simplified along with the denominator is y minus d over 2 and the second term will be minus y plus d over 2 and the denominator is y plus d over 2 absolute value raised to third power and I think that just has to be kept that way. You can't just uh, simplify it the way I did. So this step is wrong. I, you can't do it that way. Um, you just have to keep them separated. And <laughs> when you keep them separated, <laughs> you see that when you plug in y equals 0, it actually works out. Because when you get rid of all the y's, now you have this minus sign, minus, minus d half, d half so that at y equals zero, at y equals zero, this quantity doesn't go to zero. It goes to minus, um, well, it, it goes to some function of d <laughs> that's not zero. <laughs> so, um, so that makes sense in the region, um, in right midpoint between the two charges. And in the region below, now I think it should make sense. If y is um, uh, less than, in, in the place where now y is less than d over two, or minus d over two, in the area y less than minus d over two, 
So I think it's worth uh, assigning a um, letter to two quantities, y minus d over 2 and y plus d over 2. Both are negative. So let me call this A, which is negative. Call this B, which is um, also negative. So this overall quantity is going to be, um, it, it's a negative quantity because it's a numerator is negative and denominator is positive. And it's going to be um, minus 1 over absolute value A squared. And the second term here, this will also be negative. This will be minus 1 over absolute value of B squared. Now, when you take the difference of um, 1, so um, 1 over a squared minus 1 over b squared, this, uh, part, this combination is negative. Um, and combined with this minus sign, this minus sign times that quantity that's negative is positive. <laughs> so that gives a positive electric field here, upward pointing electric field. Anyways, um, sorry, that took eight minutes longer than it should. <laughs> but I think it's uh, instructive in that um, whenever you are dealing with the point charges, which uh, these dipoles are made up of, you are dealing with the infinities. Uh, there are places where if you aren't careful with the algebra you are doing, um, you do something that felt perfectly fine to you when you are doing it. Like when I was doing this, it felt perfectly fine to me, but then it comes back to bite you in the behind because um, there are some special rules you are forgetting. <laughs> so, uh, so let me leave this question of a uh, dipole there. Uh, I guess uh, um, next time I do dipole lecture again, I'll just stop with the electric field along the x-axis. That's much simpler. It, um, illustrative of something that's worth knowing without going into complications that we don't have to deal with.